Okay, uh, where, where we are in, in Ephesians. In the first three chapters, as I've said uh, repeatedly now, the first three chapters, they're dominated by the great doctrinal themes. And then uh, in, in there, Paul stresses the amazing grace that he's given, that God has given to these Gentile Christians in Jesus Christ. And we went through that, and I mean, he, he's just very heavy on what they have in Jesus Christ. And then beginning in, in chapter 4, there is a shift from predominantly theology to predominantly ethical admonition. Okay, as I said, it's not airtight. You get, of course, you get some, you know, theology here and you get some ethical admonition in, in the, the first section. But there's definitely a shift from explaining what is theirs in Christ to urging them to live consistently with that mighty salvation with which God has blessed them. So you'll see this, there, there's a, a turn at chapter 4. In chapter 4, verses 1 through 6, Paul urges them to live worthily of the blessed state to which they've been called in Jesus Christ. And specifically, he urges them to make every effort to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace, which involves conducting themselves with all humility, with all humility, with gentleness, with patience, and bearing with one another in love. This is how we maintain the unity of spirit and the bond of peace. We bear with one another in love, humility, patience. And so he, he urges them to do that. And then he underscores the unity of Christians that he's exhorted them to maintain. He then underscores that by listing seven unifying realities of the Christian experience. We talked about that last week. He tells them, you know, he underscores the unity. He tells them, look, that there's one body, one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, one, 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 one. You see? And you are all participants in the one. So he's, he, he's emphasizing this unity. Because there's not one for the Jew, one for the Gentile, one for the rich, one for the poor, one for the master, one for the slave. There's one. And you all share in that. And when we ended, we were looking at uh, chapter 4, verses 7 through 16. I want to pick back up there. I'm going to repeat some of what I said, as I typically do. But then I have a bit more I want to say about that section. I was almost through, but a little bit more I want to say about that. And then we'll move into verses 17 through 24 of chapter 4. He says in chapter 4, verse 7 through 16, But to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he took prisoners captive. He gave gifts to men. Now, what is the implication of he ascended, except that he also descended to the lower regions, the earth? He who descended is himself also the one who ascended far above all the heavens, so that he might fill all things. And he himself gave the apostles and also the prophets and the evangelists and the shepherds and teachers for the conditioning of the saints, for the work of service, for the building up of the body of Christ, until we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to the completed man, to the measure of the, of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children being tossed by waves and blown about by every wind of teaching, by the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming, Instead, let us, by speaking the truth in love, grow up in every way into him who is the head, that is Christ, from whom the entire body, being fitted together and united by every supporting ligament, brings about the growth of the body in accordance with the degree of activity of each individual part for the building up of itself in love. In verses 7 through 10... Paul explains that within the unity of the body of Christ that he's just emphasized in chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. Okay, he's stressing the unity there. And then he says in verses 7 through 10 that within that unity there's a diversity of function of the individual members. Okay, so we're not all cookie cutters. We don't all do the same thing. There is a fundamental unity in Christ, but there is a different function of the individual members. Each member has been given by the ascended Christ... And we see elsewhere that by Christ through the Spirit. But has been given by the ascended Christ a gift that enables him or her to perform his or her distinctive role within the body. So we have different functions, different roles, and we have been differently enabled to fulfill that, those functions within the body of Christ. 
And then he says in, in verses 11 through 16 that it's this victorious ascended Christ who gave to the church apostles and also prophets, evangelists, shepherds, and teachers. That's where I was talking about that when we ended last week. See, these ministers of the word, uh, they function within the body as catalysts for the body's growth. And I think that, that to see it that way is important. They function as catalysts within the church, catalysts for the, for the body's growth, as they deliver the nutrition of the Word of God. That is what, you know, you have evangelists, you have shepherds who, who, whose function is teaching, and you have teachers, which is in fact how I see what we call preachers. I see them in a teaching capacity that they are giving the Word of God to the body of Christ. So you, as they deliver this nutrition of the Word of God, the other members of the body are equipped then to disseminate the truth of Christ throughout the body. They present it initially to the body of Christ that equips all of the members of the body to disseminate that truth, to sink it through the body, to have it go deep into the body, to widen its impact, to carry that nutrition throughout the body. Okay, is how, is how I think he's, he's looking at it here. And thus to nourish the body... The ministers of the word, they condition the saints for the work of service or the work of ministry so that through that process, the body of Christ is built up. And this building up of the body of Christ, if this guy clicks, it's to continue until the consummation at Christ's return. See, until the church is, as a whole is as fully like Christ as it will be which will, will happen at the consummation. The body is to be built up in root to the consummation that it may progress toward this goal of complete Christ-likeness, that it may increasingly grow out of this immaturity, see, that makes it vulnerable to theological con men. Now see, that's important to see here. You see, he says, so that we may no longer be children being tossed by ways theologically unstable. See, doctrinally unstable, not understanding truths that ground you so you're vulnerable it says, waves blown about by every wind of teaching, by the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming. Sometimes teaching doctrine and these things, it gets a bad name. People say, well, you know, why do you want to mess with that? You know, just tell me a couple of basic things and let's get on with it. But see, you have to be grounded. You have to understand you become, the you become vulnerable if you're not rooted and grounded in these kinds of things. And so he, he talks about that so that they may increasingly grow out of this immaturity that makes them vulnerable to these theological con men who peddle false teaching that undermines the apostolic gospel. You see this all through the New Testament. He's writing and saying, you have to watch these people in Colossae. What are they doing? Oh, they're talking about Christ, but they're saying you lack fullness. How about these people in Galatia? What are they doing? Yeah, they're talking about Christ, but they're saying you've got to come under the law. And you see him always writing, saying, listen, you know, we would say it's a jungle out there. And it hasn't lessened, it's gotten worse. There are all kinds of voices that are saying, no, no, here, this is how you go, this is how you go, this is... And people have to be grounded. They have to be taught. And so then when the word of God is given, it is then taken through the body as the members are built up, and then we, we transmit these truths throughout the body. Instead of being mired in infancy that makes them unstable. The members are to speak the truth out of love for one another. See, out of a commitment to one another's welfare. That's why we speak the truth. That's why we share these things with one another. It's not so you think, well, you know, you're really cool. Not so you can get up on somebody. Not so you... It is to bless people because we care about one another. Right? Isn't that tough love? I mean, wasn't that a message from decades gone by? That tough love is really the way to love? That you tell people things they need to hear, even if they don't want to hear it. Okay, so somehow you see that you see this idea of speaking the truth out of love for one another, out of a commitment to one another's welfare, which is the opposite of the deceivers, right? They're not committed to your welfare. The deceivers are not committed to your welfare. The deceivers are trying to harm you. Now they don't come that way. They don't come and say, hey, by the way, I'm trying to kill you spiritually. That's what I'm trying to do. They don't say that. Never say that. They always come and say, I have a better idea and I understand things deeper than you do. You see? And that's how it works. And, oh, really? You see, in Colossae, no, 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 we understand about Jesus. 
he's a good start, but if you want fullness with God, you need to placate these spiritual beings. Oh, that sounds pretty deep. Ooh, that's heavy. You see? So this is how this works. And he's telling them, listen, speak the truth to one another out of love and through, the, through that dissemination of truth, uh, the body grows in all respects in Christ's likeness. Okay, now notice that it's from Christ that the entire body brings about the growth of the body in accordance with the activity of each of the individual parts. We all have a function to play. Okay, but it is, it is from Christ that the entire body does this. The growth is supplied from Christ the head as the body in union with the head serves as a conduit. See, we are connected to Christ and as the body in union with the head serves as a conduit for Christ's transforming power through the dissemination of divine truth. So we have these ministers of the word who enable the members of the congregation to disseminate this truth, this nutritious word of God throughout the community and through this attachment and contact with Christ, through presenting his word to the body of Christ, his transforming power is at work within the body. It comes from Christ. You see, and if you cut yourself off from Christ, you get nothing. So these ministers of the word are connected there, and every supporting ligament that is mentioned is probably a reference to the ministers of the word. Okay, as ligaments, they, what do they do? They physically connect or join together various body parts. That's how ligaments function. They connect or join together various body parts, Ministers of the word, they serve to connect the various members of the church by being the initial purveyors of the truths they hold in common. You see, they bind us together as the initial presenters to the body of Christ of the truths they hold in common. They serve a unifying or cohering purpose in the church as providers of a common message. Okay, a common message that we present to the body of Christ and we are brought together Through this teaching, O'Brien says, Peter O'Brien, as you know, commentator I I like on this book, he says, in this summarizing picture of verse 16, both gifted ministers and gifted members have a part to play in the body's growth. The former are represented by the ligaments, which provide connections between the other parts of the body, while the latter have their distinct role to play in the well-being of the whole. So that's how I see this working together, that the ministers of the word are catalysts for the body's growth. But every part has a role to play as we disseminate these divine truths, and then Christ in that process transforms us. He brings us to maturity. He brings us so that in all ways we are closer to him, uh, we are more Christ-like. All right, 17 to 24. He says, therefore I say this, And solemnly declare in the Lord, you are no longer to walk as the Gentiles also walk, in the futility of their minds, being darkened in understanding, having been alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to licentiousness so as to practice every kind of impurity with greed. But you did not learn Christ that way. For surely you heard of him and were taught in him, as the truth is in Jesus, that regarding your former way of life, you are to put off the old man who is being corrupted in accordance with the desires of deceit, to be renewed in the spirit of your mind and to put on the new man who is created according to the likeness of God in righteousness and holiness of the truth. So here Paul now, he he winds up, he's getting back to the exhortation, this ethical admonition that he began in chapter 4, verses 1 through 3, but he does so in light of of his responsibility as an apostle that he just went through in verses 7 through 16. He's talked about the function of the ministers of the word. Christ gave to the body of Christ, the apostles and prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers. He has a function to play, and it is in light of what he's just said about that function, okay, he now is going to tell them something. Okay, part of the truth he is to convey to the saints is how they are to live. That's part of what he's doing as an apostle. God gave the apostles to the church. 
They are ministers of the word. Part of what he is to do is to tell the saints how they're to live, to convey that to him, to tell them their ethical responsibilities as Christians. We do have ethical responsibilities, right? And we are called to live a certain way. The gospel is not simply, listen, uh, yes, Jesus died for us and saved us. Okay, that's fine. There it is. Now let me get on with my life. I've taken advantage of the sin cleanser. Do you think that's what Christianity is? Do you not see this call to come and die, to give your life? It is God's revolution. That's what it is. So, of course, there are ethical responsibilities that we have in light of what God has given us. And Paul is calling these Gentile Christians. He says, listen, you have a responsibility. Okay, you have to live a certain way. He tells them that they can no longer live as Gentiles live. That's the way I lived. You know, I wasn't raised in the church. I know some of you were. But he says, you can't live that way. You cannot live that way. The way that the Gentiles live. Those who've turned their backs on God and no longer have an awareness of or sensitivity to Him. God didn't mean anything to me. It was like a joke. Just turn on TV. Listen to the talking heads. Listen to the, the elite of the culture. Mock God. Okay? Dawkins, I just saw this morning, calling somebody an idiot. The Simeone professor, you know, he's brilliant. Okay? Couldn't find his way out of a paper bag. All right? Uh, just a little side note. Uh, Who is it? Alvin Plantinga. I don't know if you know him. Alvin Plantinga is a world-class Christian philosopher. He's pretty much changed the whole nature of the debate about the existence of God. He's at Notre Dame. Well, he read Dawkins' little piece, and he said, and this ought to worry Dawkins, but it won't because he's too arrogant. But he says something, he says, listen, uh, I would say that Dawkins' reasoning is sophomoric, but I don't want to insult sophomores. <laughs> but yet I got to look at this guy as the epitome of uh, you know, intellect here. Why? The other factors at work here in a culture that's pushing it, but I, I digress, okay. All right, so he, he says here that uh, not to live as the Gentiles do who are insensitive, who don't have an awareness of God. He says, you know, they have, they've thrown off all restraint. They've given themselves to licentiousness or sometimes translated debauchery so as to practice impurity with greed, which I think the NIV captures when it says with a continual lust for more. Okay, what is it? These are people who are just racing, you know, to live the way they want to. Particularly matters of sexual impurity and all that. Look at our culture. Look at it. You see, this is it. And so he's telling these Gentiles who've grown up like this, he says, look, you must no longer live that way. You can no longer live as Gentiles live. Now he's confident that they'd been taught, and this is another idea which makes me think it's a letter to a group of, of churches in Asia Minor, but he's confident, see, that they've been taught that being a Christian was incompatible with a sinful lifestyle. We have to tell people this. You know, we don't try to just uh, snag people into the kingdom, try to hide from them. You know, you know the whole thing where Jesus talks about the cost of discipleship, where you have to lay out for people. You know, what, you know will, will the king who's got so many, so many troops, will he go against, will the guy who's building the tower, will he not first sit down and see? You have to tell people what Christ calls them to. You can't hide that from them. Tell them to come in and then spring it on them later. You have to say, listen, guy says, you know, I remember when John was talking to me. I told John, I said, listen, you can quit drinking, but I don't think, you know, forget it. I'll never quit drinking. Because I like getting drunk. I don't never quit. Okay, you don't hide that. You say, listen, okay, that's your choice. You can continue to live the way you want and make yourself God. Or you pick Christ and make him Lord and you follow him. But what you cannot do is cut the third path, live like your God, and claim Jesus Christ. Okay? So he sits here and he's telling them. And we have to tell one another. Okay? We have to tell one another. You can no longer live. You were taught, I hope, I hope you were taught that when you come to Jesus Christ, you give up everything. 
All of the things that you were harboring and holding on to, you say, no, I like this. I like getting stoned. I like getting drunk. I like looking at these things. I like talking this way. I like, I like, I like, I like. And Christ says, pick. I am the Lord. I have died for you. I call you to come and give me everything. Clean it out. You hold on to nothing. You clean it out and you give me everything and you commit your life to following me. Okay, he's telling them, he says, listen, you were taught this way. You were taught that being a Christian is incompatible with a sinful lifestyle. You don't say, okay, I'll just add a little Christ. Sure, I'm living with people. I'm living with my girlfriend. We're sleeping together. Who cares? I'll just add a little Christ. Sure, I like getting drunk and stoned. I'll just continue that, and then I'll add a little Christ. Do you think that's what Christianity is? Do you not see the radicalness of it? It's scary. It is scary when he sits here and says, I'm calling you to come and die. You got what's going to happen? Do you, when I became a Christian, I had another life. In fact, I tell people sometimes in my former life, I was doing, I did not know that this many years down the road, I would be here in this place doing what I'm doing. You do not know. But when Christ calls you, he says, I'm calling you. You don't know where that's going to turn out. Anymore, you sign up for the Marines, you don't know where that's going to wind up. Right? You've got an idea, but you understand I'm in lock, stock, and barrel. Okay? I'm in lock, stock, and barrel. And that's how it is. And Christ calls them and he's telling them, you were taught this way. It's incompatible with a sinful lifestyle. He feels sure they've been taught the necessity of changing the way they live, making a fundamental break with their unethical past. There is a turning point. That's why I look at that, that girl, uh, Carrie Prejean, who was out, you know, she was... Uh, some kind of beauty queen, and then some kind of stink came up, and she said that, well, she thought homosexual conduct was sinful. In our culture, that's the sin, saying that. And so she got booted for some reason, and out come all of these, uh, you know, videos of her, uh, immoral stuff. And I don't know. You see, if somebody sits here and says, listen, if, if she came out and said, listen, that, that was in my other life before I was a Christian. Right? That was in my other life. I turned to Jesus Christ. Now, I don't know anything about her background. I'm just saying, see, there, there is this break with your unethical past. You could go point to all kinds of things in my life. What'd you do? Yeah, I did that, did that, did that, did that, did that, did that, did that. Live that way. And see, but Christ calls you and he says, listen, this isn't a negotiation. This isn't a bargain with me. So you sit here and say, well, how much of my sin can I hold on to? I'm calling you to come and die. I'm calling you to give me your life. Now give it or don't. I won't take the air away if you don't and make you come to me. I'm offering it to you. I died for you. Now you come and live for me. Okay, you come and live for me. Now if you want to talk about what is it that generates growth in a church, I've said, you know, many times, we get off on what in my judgment are the silliest things. You know, the silliest thing, well, you know, I don't know, I don't think people like the color of the wall. I think if we had a nice fuchsia, they would come in. You know, I, do, you, do you not think that it's something about people sensing a radical move of God? Where people are not just talking, they're surrendered to Christ, living for Christ, loving one another. Do you not think that that really draws people? I think that does. And so Paul's saying to these guys, living in a world, you think of the world, it's probably like this world, like America, Western society, sin dripping everywhere, sex everywhere, godlessness everywhere. And he's saying, listen, you were taught, see, you were taught that you, under, you had to change the way you live. You had to make this fundamental break with your unethical un- past. Choose it or don't choose it. But don't say you're choosing it and then keep living the way you were. Say you need to keep thinking about it. You can't rush people into commitment to Christ. You can't. You have to let them see Jesus and come to the point where they say, all right, I'm ready to jump out of the plane. I'm right at the threshold. I believe him. I understand he's true. Now I'm ready to jump. I'm giving him my life. I'm giving him my life. you got to get people to that point where they really commit their lives. 
And so he said these people were taught that way. They'd been taught to say goodbye to the sinful person they once were, a person who was in a state of moral decay as a result of the the desires that had been spawned by the lie in which they wrapped themselves, the lie that they weren't accountable to God. That's the lie that our culture is spinning around everybody. No, 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 you're, you know, no you're, you're on your own. This idea about God, that's crazy. Who is it, Hitchens, in his, one of his debates? I'm talking about God. I, I just simply can't believe in a God who cares who you sleep with. What a small-minded God. This is uh, Hitchens. You're sitting there rebuking God. Okay, you got the, these people. See, well, he, he's a, he, he can't be concerned with this kind of thing. So they wrap themselves in this idea, I'm not accountable to God. From that come these, deceit, these desires that flow out of that. And then I'm on my own, baby. I'm just free-falling. I'm like an animal. Our culture's doing it. But Paul says, listen, you weren't taught that way. You were taught to say goodbye. And that's what we have to teach everybody who comes and sees Jesus Christ. There is a new life for you. I understand you've been bogged down in sin. I understand you've been trapped. I understand your life is a drag because you've what, you rejected God. But there is hope for newness, not simply sin cleansing. There is hope for a new life. You were taught that way. You don't have to be in this. You were taught to say no and to cut off your unethical past, to put on and take off that old person and to put on a new person. When they were taught in Christ, they also were urged to be renewed in the spirit of their minds. This is an interesting phrase, the spirit of their minds. The expression spirit of your mind is probably, it's unusual, and it's probably is a way of speaking about the person's inner life. Okay, you were taught here to, to be renewed on the inside, on the inner person. See, isn't that what all this stuff about, you know, People are going and paying money to, uh, you know, self-help this and self-help that. Who do you think can change you inside more? Do you believe that God can change you on the inside? Do you think he can make you into a different person? Or do you have to go to somebody, who, some beard stroker, who sits here and rejects God? Only he has the answer for that. Only he can help you. The power of God's spirit in your life cannot do that. So real problems, you see. Oh, we can say, but if I have real need of change in my life, that God can't do it. He can change you. Okay, He can change you and He can transform you on the inside. He says, be renewed in the spirit of your mind. As O'Brien says, they are to yield themselves to God and allow themselves to be renewed in their inner person. This is similar to Paul's exhortation in Romans 12 to be transformed by the renewal of of your mind. What does Paul say to the Corinthians? Paul writes down, he says, he goes through this list. Some of you were this, 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 this. That's what you were. You can't change that. You can't change those things. I'm looking at it right here in the text. What do you mean I can't change those things? That's what you were. What happened? Now, if you come into Christ with this idea of, listen, I'm making a bargain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. People are on me about, yeah, yeah, okay, okay. I'll go get dunked in the water. Blah, blah, blah. Well, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about conversion. I'm talking about seeing Jesus Christ for who he is. Son of God, crucified, resurrected, Lord of all, and saying, I'm in. I'm in. There's power there. Because you have then given your life and you've opened yourself up to the transformation of the Spirit of God. If you want to fight that, okay, well, you're going to be mired. Because as I said, he's not going to take the air away and whip you like a dog and say, okay, I'll do it. He's not going to do it. He says, I've done what I've done. I've told you what I've done. Now come to me. Come to me. Okay, Paul, he tells him here, look, part of this, they were taught in Christ. They were urged to be renewed in the spirit of their minds. And this inward renewal is the work of the Holy Spirit. Okay, this is quoting O'Brien again. Titus 3, verse 5. Progressively transforming believers into the image of Christ from one degree of glory to another. 
2 Corinthians 3.18. It is by the Spirit's power that the inner being is renewed every day. 2 Corinthians 4.16. So do you see this? Do you see how God can take you? He's telling them. These people who are in a dark world, just like our world is dark, he's saying, listen, there is power. There is victory over these things. That's how you learn Christ. You don't stay over here in these things. You come out of these things. And you live to the glory of God. And that's what they were taught. And they were taught to put on the new self who displays the ethical qualities belonging to God, such as righteousness and holiness. Righteousness and holiness. You were taught. Christian, you were taught. I hope you were taught. That this is, it's not going to be same old, same old. When you come to Jesus Christ, not going to be the same old. It's going to be something different. People ought to look around and say, what happened to you? What happened to you? You know, you were this way, and now look at you. Well, I've come to believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That should say it, right? I mean, shouldn't that have an impact on how you live? Or do you think that a person who believes that's the truth would live the same as somebody who doesn't? Of course not. You wouldn't believe that. Okay, now, he, he displays of righteousness and holiness, Andrew Lincoln says in his commentary. Here the language reflects a perspective in which there's a combination of God's gracious initiative and human responsibility. This is how it always is. God at work, but you have something to do. Okay, he goes on, he says, as it is made clear that the new person is created by God, but must be put on by the believer. Who gets the, pra the praise? Who gets the glory for your transformed life? God. Who did it? God. He has remade you. But does that mean you can sit here? It's like eating. You got the bean, just sit here and go, eat, just set it here. Just set it here. Or do you have to chew it? Do you see there's something here? We have some responsibility to be open to the transformation of the Spirit of God, to put on the new man. But who makes the new man? God. So you always see this. Okay, these two things going. These virtues of righteousness and holiness, they're a product of the truth. That's that odd little phrase there. He says at the end, in righteousness and holiness of the truth. Okay, they're, they are virtues. These virtues are a product of the truth. They flow from the truth of God's work and call in Christ. Okay, so it's in that sense that they are of the truth. 425. See, we're going to actually break into five. You didn't think we'd ever get to five. Look, look at me, Ma. We ain't going to five. All right. It says, therefore, having put off falsehood, let each one speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your provoked state, and do not give an opportunity to the devil. Let the one who steals steal no longer, but rather let him labor doing with his own hands what is good so that he may have something to share with the person in need. Let no spoiled word proceed from your mouth, but whatever is good for building up according to the need so that it may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and shouting and slander be removed from you along with all malice. Be kind to one another, compassionate, forgiving one another, just as God in Christ forgave you. Be imitators of God, therefore, as beloved children, and walk in love, just as Christ also loved us and gave himself up on our behalf, an offering and sacrifice to God resulting in a fragrant aroma. Okay, Paul, he now elaborates on some specific consequences of their responsibility to put off the old man and to put on the new. Okay, he's going to elaborate on some specific consequences of that. Each of them is to put off falsehood and speak the truth to the other members of the body. See, if the body is to be healthy, if the body is to be something that is growing, truth has to be coursing through it. Truth has to be coursing through it. Falsehood is like a pathogen to the body. Lies, deceit, falsehood, all of those things are like pathogens to the body. 
If the body is to grow, if the body is to be healthy, truth has to be coursing through it. So he says to them, speak the truth to one another. Speak the truth with his neighbor. Okay, those you're connected with. We speak the truth. Not only about the, the things of divine truths of God. We speak the truths in application to people. Not just the doctrinal things. But we speak the truth to one another. And in light of the responsibility to speak the truth to one another, they're told in verse 26 and 27 to deal swiftly with their righteous anger. Okay, I believe this is righteous anger, and I'll explain why in a second. But he says, to deal swiftly with their righteous anger. Now, presumably, they are to do that by speaking the truth to the one who provoked it. But they are to deal swiftly with their righteous anger so as not to allow anger to deteriorate into sin. Anger is a powerful emotion. Even when it's righteous, even when it's justified, it is a powerful emotion. Okay, anger is, is something that is very powerful, and it's something that even when it's proper, it's dangerous. It's easy for anger to get out of hand. You see, in sinful human beings, anger, even righteous anger, it readily morphs into malice, into resentment, into bitterness. And so harboring anger, it provides an opportunity for the devil to do evil. You're, 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 you're sitting there, if you're holding on to this anger, you're holding something that's very volatile. So you don't want to hold on to this for a long time. Now, I think the anger addressed here is righteous anger, because he speaks of it, he says, when he says, be angry and do not sin. Okay, there is an anger that you can have that is not sinful. There is a righteous anger. You can see that Jesus was angry in Mark chapter 3, verse 5, and yet we know that Jesus was without sin, Right? You see that in 2 Corinthians 5.21, Hebrews 4.15, 1 Peter 2.22. We know that. Yet he's clearly, it says he's angry, and yet he didn't sin. So there is a type of anger one can have that is not sinful. And we often label this, the typical way of speaking about this is to call it righteous indignation. Okay, and there's something, there's room for this, and I think it's a valid idea. I want to read you a couple of quotes on it. One is from a guy named Robertson McQuilkin. And this is from his book, An Introduction to Biblical Ethics. It's a second edition. He says, righteous and unrighteous anger can be distinguished by the cause of anger. One should be angry over sin that offends God, harms others, or harms the person sitting. You understand that, right? I mean, you don't, you don't consider it a noble thing for somebody, somebody's torturing a child, and you just go, oh, well, you know, that's all right. You know, doesn't bother me. Right? Who does that? Would you, sit and, would you think that was godly? Would you think that was you know, honorable, noble? No, you'd think, what are you doing? What are you, crazy? And you would be angry. And you would be justified in being angry. But he goes on, he says, the difficulty with being righteously indignant is that our motives are mixed. Am I distressed over a sin that offends God and harms people? Or am I angry over the way I'm affected? See, this is the thing. We don't talk a lot about righteous indignation because... We are so wrapped up in personal anger. You see, and I'll, I have another quote here that will bring this out more. He says, anger is sinful when it's for the wrong reasons or results in the wrong action. To keep this emotion from igniting for the wrong reason or from burning out of control, Scripture gives two ways of control. Take it easy. Don't get angry suddenly, James 1.19, and don't let it keep burning. Don't let it last till the next day. Either a low flash point, a quick response without reflection, or a slow burn continuing on with the emotions, seem to risk causing even righteous indignation to go astray. So this is something that is to be, is to be dealt with quickly. Here is what O'Brien says. There's a proper place for righteous anger, but also the subtle temptation to regard my anger as righteous indignation and other people's anger as sheer bad temper. <laughs> Isn't that right? I mean, come on. I live in here. I know that's right. You see? I'm always protecting myself. So, that, so this, this resonates. If ours is not free from injured pride, malice, or a spirit of revenge, it has degenerated into sin. The warning of James 1, 19 and 20 makes the same point. Everyone should be slow to become angry, for human anger does not bring about the righteous life that God desires. Okay, so you have here this, this idea he's talking about when he says here, you know, be angry and do not sin and don't let the sun go down on you. This even righteous anger. 
needs to be dealt with because it is an explosive emotion. And I think he means that it needs to be dealt with by going and speaking to the person who provoked it. And I just think, wouldn't that solve an awful lot? What typically happens is, you chap me, okay? Or I should chap, would, that carries the idea of not let You do something that, that upsets me where it's proper for me to be upset, and what happens? I don't go and say, hey, Steve, let me talk to you. I don't do that. I go over here and I tell Terry, I said, Terry, you know what Steve's doing? Can you believe what this guy did to me? I probably wouldn't go to Terry. I'd probably pick somebody else I'd trust wouldn't say anything. <laughs> you know? And so what happens? See, what happens? Rather than resolution, you have this fragmentation. And you're going to see this is the big thing he's after. This idea of unity and cohesion in the body of Christ is crucial. And it started in 1, 9, and 10 where he says, listen, the ultimate goal is the complete harmonization of the cosmos. You see? And we are the reflection of that. I heard that bell. Thanks. <laughs>